All right, I'm bringing up the streams right now. Sixty seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and we're already uh, live on face uh, on YouTube, but okay, we're rolling. All right. Uh, good morning, folks. It's. April 23rd, 2019. We're here in Longview, Texas. Uh, today we're going to talk about dead standing timber and more specifically about dead Engelmann spruce timber that's been killed by spruce bark beetles. Before we get into that, let me just make it a, a, make a couple of announcements to you. Uh, tomorrow I'll be heading over to LJ, Georgia our Eastern office, and we're going to have a seminar there on Saturday. And then the following Saturday, which will be May the 3rd and 4th, uh, we're going to be back here in Longview for our uh, big spring seminar here. I think we've still got a few spots available for the Longview seminar, so you might want to give us a call if you're interested in that at 903-663-1729. Uh, or 800-777-7288. All right, something near and dear to my heart is talking about dead standing timber. And uh, if you don't get a chance to go into the Intermountain West, uh, or if you have it in a long time, it would shock you if you, if you went that way. Uh, our, our forests are uh, I hate to say it, but they're decimated uh, because of either forest fire or uh, uh, covering a lot more acreage. We have uh, areas that have been killed by uh, spruce beetle epidemics and at a lower elevation, the mountain pine beetle epidemics. I read something the other day that there are maybe six million dead trees in the state of Colorado. Now, I can't imagine somebody counting them, but I'm going to guess that that uh, number is, is a little on the low side. Can we start bringing up some, some pictures here, Danny? You bet. Uh, I want to I just show you some, some of the landscape out there that's being blighted by these beetle epidemics. We, we have uh, uh, been working for, well, you know, we, we've been at this for 45 years, 1974, and the first log homes that we built were out of dead standing timber. This particular mountainside you're looking at, I believe, Danny, wasn't this on the UM uh, timber sale down in uh, South Central uh, Utah? That would have been on the uh, Fish Lake National Forest? Yes, yes. Uh, that I, uh, and, and one of these days I'm going to get Danny to go back to the same place and take another picture of this same hillside you're looking at right here. And uh, uh, it, it's going to be really, really sad. Uh, with, with what you're looking at, you can tell that, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent of the trees are dead. Well, if we had gone back a couple of years later, that would have been 90, 95 percent dead. A couple of years after that, it would have been 98, 99, maybe even 100 percent dead trees. But all over the Intermountain West, uh, this is a terrible, terrible problem. Now, I, I don't want to get too political about it, but you know, back when we started in 1974, we were, were getting house logs from, from a company called Wolf Creek Industries at Pagosa Springs, Colorado. The timber was coming from Chama Land and Cattle Company in extreme northern New Mexico uh, around the town of Chama. 
since 1974, we've gone through rare one, rare two, the different roadless rules, uh, major political changes with the Forest Service, with the change with the administration in Washington. We've gone through spotted owls and Canadian lynx and and uh, who knows how, how many other uh, endangered or claim to be endangered species uh, that have shut down the forest. Uh, you know, at, back in the 70s and maybe the early 80s, you know, we were faced with a horrible problem with global cooling that was taking place. Then they decided it was global warming. Uh, now, uh, it's not political or politically correct uh, to say global warming because maybe it's global cooling also, so we say climate change. Well, you know, climate change has been occurring since the Earth was created, and that's just an absolute fact of life. And, and all it takes is, is one volcano to start erupting for two or three days, and that can undo the, the work that do-gooders do to try to uh, uh, lower emissions and uh, affect the ozone layer and whatever else uh, for, for decades. Uh, I, maybe you can tell from my attitude, I, I, I don't buy in to a lot of the science that is out there, but the reason I even bring this up is uh, there are several factors that have caused these horrible problems all across the Intermountain West. And when I'm talking about this, you know, we've got beetle epidemics that have killed timber in New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, uh, British Columbia, uh, well, basically all over the, the western half of Canada. Uh, they see a lot of the same problems that we see down in the states. And, of course, because of where we're located at Cider White Log Homes, we're more concerned about Utah, Colorado, maybe than other states. But, but you know, you could, you could drive across I-70 from Denver and go through the Eisenhower Tunnel and down on the other side, at, or still at a high, high elevation, and you start seeing an awful lot of dead trees, an awful lot of dead trees. Well, if you would turn north, you could drive all the way up into Wyoming and never not being be and never not be looking at uh, forests that are absolutely dead because of the beetle epidemics. Now, back in the 80s, uh, with the environmental movement growing pretty dramatically in Colorado, we had some environmental groups that that. Uh, I thought we were evil because we owned chainsaws. And I, I hate that that ever happened. Some of those same groups now in 2019 uh, consider us the golden boys because you guys are taking out those, those dead trees that need to be removed. Well, that's what we've been doing for 45 years is using dead standing timber and hopefully using it for its highest and best use and going into beautiful log homes. Um, but anyway, we had quite, quite a fight on our hands in Colorado politically in the 80s and into the 90s. I went to a number of public meetings with the state forester for Colorado, and he would tell people that, folks, we're setting up the perfect storm in our forest in Colorado uh, by not thinning the timber by not taking actions to chemically or otherwise address the, the spread of beetle epidemics. And, uh, well, it was, it, it was just a shame because, uh, you know, his cries fell on deaf ears for the most part, but the way he said things were going to happen is exactly the way it happened. And uh, uh, for, the, for the more environmentally attuned uh, folks out there, you know, we're losing a, a huge uh, oxygen generator when we lose our forest. Uh, we we uh, lose a carbon sink 
that takes up carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. Uh, and as, as wood decays, it starts uh, uh, giving off the bad gases that uh, uh, we don't want to don't have spreading across the, across the planet. So something needs to be done. Uh, Forest Service has been working for a number of years to help remove as much timber as, uh, dead timber as possible. And they've done a, a, a good job of reforestation by either uh, natural reseeding that occurs and by planting of seedlings right behind removal of, of dead trees in the forest. Now, let's talk just a minute about uh, uh, some of these areas and let's just, I'll, I'll just pick one to look at here. Uh, this is one of our log trucks and uh, I'm trying to think that that was on the White River National Forest, this uh, picture you're looking at, which, which White River is a, a big national forest in uh, uh, west central uh, Colorado. Uh, and and uh, in our logging experience, we've worked on a number of national forests. The, uh, the White River was the most prevalent in our early years, uh, but we also on the, on the, on the route uh, down in southern Colorado right now, we're working on the Rio Grande National Forest. On down in, in region uh, three in New Mexico, we have worked on the uh, Santa Fe National Forest there. Uh, over in Utah, we've worked on the Manti Lasall, the uh, Wasatch Cash Uinta National Forest, the Dixie the Fish Lake National Forest, and uh, I think those are the main ones that we, we have, have operated on over the years. But, but back to this picture of this log truck, uh, we, we remove, uh, no telling how many thousands of tons of dead trees per year from our logging operations. And, and the Engelman spruce that we're, we're trying to get out of the forest generally starts growing at 92, 9,300 foot elevations and goes from there up to the tree line. If, if, we, were, uh, if we were looking at, a, at kind of a, a cross section of, a, of alpine, uh, an alpine area, an alpine forest, you'd have Engelman spruce mixed with some subalpine fir, a little bit lower than that, we go uh, blend into the aspen band. Uh, below the aspen, we have lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, uh, other, other species, but those are the predominant species that we're concerned about. And, and uh, let me get a little more specific to uh, the bug that's, that's causing all this. The damage that we see across millions of acres in the western United States and in western Canada is either a spruce bark beetle or a pine bark beetle. Uh, looking at the, the photograph in front of you here, this is showing one that the, the bugs have killed the tree, the bark is starting to fall off of it, and you'll notice the checks or cracks that are appearing in the surface of the wood as the tree is, is very slowly and naturally drying out. This is optimum for us to use in log, in log homes. Now, uh, this is from a bark beetle epidemic. Let me show you one. This is from forest fire. This, this shot was from the Santa Fe National Forest, uh, east, northeast of Pecos, uh, New Mexico. And this was a, an area we were logging back in uh, around 2004, 2005. And uh, uh, the effect is nearly the same whether trees are killed by forest fire or from uh, beetle epidemics. In a forest fire situation though, uh, you notice some of these trees are charred pretty heavily. Uh, most are not. This was a very fast moving fire. In fact, it was reported to have gone up some slopes at about 40 miles an hour. So nothing could outrun it uh, unless they got a big head start. But the, the problem with fire kill timber like this, uh, uh, you have spots of char, 
that are really hard on, on uh, sawmill equipment. They make everything dirty and messy and, and get that charcoal or, or the carbon uh, on clean wood and make a pretty good mess. On top of that, you have pockets of char that work into the tree from the surface and, and may render a particular log useless. All right, as you can see in this photograph, uh, a majority of the trees have none, none or little charring, and that's because it was such a fast-moving fire that literally cooked the bark off the trees. The bark fell off in short order, leaving nice clean wood underneath. And uh, uh, we were sawing this at our mill at Pecos, New Mexico for, uh, I think we were there three or four years, just working on this one area. Uh, an odd characteristic of fire kill timber that we have observed, though, is that uh, rot occurs differently than it occurs in beetle kill timber, and that we have pocket rot on, in fire kill timber that you know, ever so often up the tree, a spot of rot may just work itself into near the center of the tree and, and ruins an awful lot of the products that we'd make out of it. Uh, the other thing is with fire kill timber, we have beetle infestations that occur in the lower part of the tree quickly after a forest fire. Uh, and, and they don't operate that quickly in beetle kill. And I'm talking about different species of beetles that bore uh, holes into the trees and can literally make the, the bottom uh, 20 feet of, of a tree uh, look like Swiss cheese from, from big, ugly uh, tunnels being bored through the tree. And that happens a lot in fire killed uh, as, as opposed to uh, uh, beetle killed. Okay, let's look around at a few national forests and, and some of the logging that we have done. Uh, <coughs> there, the Dixie National Forest in Utah, a place that we have done an awful lot of logging. Notice just a nice uh, sign welcoming, um, welcoming folks to the forest and look at all the dead trees in, in the background there. Uh, another one in Utah, uh, terrible cedar breaks down uh, west of Cedar City and east of uh, Panguitch, uh, Utah. Beautiful country, but, it, but the forest has just been devastated there. And we've been logging uh, in and around the Cedar Breaks National Monument area uh, since the mid-90s. Uh, mid uh, we're still getting logs from down in that, in that same area. Um, I want to show you something that we're really proud of with, with our work with dead standing timber. But at our timber sales, we, we, we put these signs up so that the driving public knows that we are the ones doing the logging in this particular area. Uh, we, we take our responsibilities as loggers very seriously. Several of our timber sales have been, uh, have been used for congressional tours to bring congressmen and staff out to show folks how logging of dead timber needs to be done. Uh, you know, I'm awfully proud that we get, we've been selected that way uh, uh, more than once. Um, as I mentioned, we've taught, worked with the Forest Service for uh, lots and lots of years. Our first timber sale that we bought ourselves was in 1983. So that's, uh, what, 36 years that we've been working with the Forest Service on, on, uh, on timber sales. Uh, and, and we've worked in, in uh, basically three different states uh, an awful lot with them. Uh, we, we, we try and the Forest Service tries to leave a forest in uh, much better shape than, than we found it by taking out as much dead timber as possible, making room for and replanting uh, a, a new green forest that uh, hopefully in a generation or two will have have some full size trees. Of course, you gotta you gotta realize at the at the elevation that we're talking about. Uh, here's a Brian Head ski area. 
uh, in, in Utah. Well, there's a ski area uh, that, that, you know, the, the area was absolutely ruined by a bee epidemic that came through and then a subsequent forest fire that wiped out a lot of the homes and structures uh, in and around Bryan Head. And uh, uh, I hate to say it, but that, that picturesque ski area is just a, a shadow of what it once was because of the dead timber uh, not being removed fast enough and then forest fire coming through and, and being catastrophic. In, in our forest, if we don't remove the dead timber uh, timely, then this is what starts happening. Trees start rotting in the ground after so many years. They start falling over. And in a lot of areas, we have, we have seen uh, big spruce trees that are sh so jackstrawed that even, that even the elk have a real difficult time moving through the forest. Uh, now, imagine uh, a dry part of the year forest fire getting started. Well, it doesn't have uh, much of a problem moving through this. And look at the, the amount of fuel that is close to the ground right here that could, could uh, help fuel a, a, a terrible, catastrophic forest fire. Those particular trees are um, on Brian Head right at tree line um, at the peak. And, okay, um, okay. Danny, are, are, are you on? I am on. Okay, good. And, and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, generally, at the latitude of Colorado and Utah, the tree line is at about 11,500 feet. And that's the, that's the height in the mountains that, that trees quit growing because it just gets too high elevation for them. So, so we're as high as it gets uh, at, at the tree line. Uh, and uh, we get to work right up to that tree line in a lot of areas. I'm, you know, I've, for, for years I've been very jealous of, of uh, our son, Nick, and his family. Now this is a few years old, but this is Nick Sider White. He runs our logging operations in Colorado and Utah. And uh, I said, I'm jealous, I really am, because the equipment that he gets to operate on and the places he gets to work are such that when he breaks over a ridge at 10, 5, 11,000, 11, 5, you feel like you're looking over the whole world. You know, it's just a, it's a wonderful experience to, uh, to do. Back to, back to this one. This was our uh, log yard that we had for many years just north of Panguitch, Utah. Uh, and we used it to uh, quickly log from the mountains to this yard. And uh, uh, then in the winter and spring when we couldn't log in the mountains, we'd be shuttling the logs from this yard up to our mill in Gunnison which was 108 miles away from the yard. Notice that our Texas headquarters was 1,551 miles away uh, from that yard by, by road. So I, I, I guess one of the biggest points I want to make is we believe so strongly in the attributes of using dead timber that we're willing to have operations that far away from our headquarters, which is a logistical problem. It's very challenging to me uh, because I'm trying to uh, manage operations. You know, uh, our, our mill is like 1,340 miles from our headquarters here in Longview, and, it, and it, it really gets tough sometimes. But we just believe so, so much in using dead timber. Okay, let's, let's talk about the life cycle a little bit of, of these bugs. And I'm going to go back to, I got, Danny's got me too many choices here of some beautiful scenery to show y'all. Uh, all right. Typical mountainside that has been ravaged by uh, spruce bark beetles. That bark beetle is a little dark brown to black beetle who is only maybe three eighths of an inch long and they can fly, unlike some, some members of the beetle family. And uh, they fly to a green tree and they uh, bore their way into the bark, lay eggs. The next warm season, a larva hatches out of the egg and that larva becomes a white grub 
that is about a half inch long and they literally mine the bark off of the tree. They're, what, what these uh, beetles are after uh, for that grub to grow and be able to pupate into an adult is the cambium layer of the tree, which the cambium layer is, a, is only a, a cell thick layer between the bark and the wood of a tree. And, and uh, the cambium is where the nutrient flow is. So that's the richest part of the tree. And uh, these bark beetles, uh, their life cycle, cycle depends on that cambium layer. The, the, the larva uh, get into the cambium and they literally mine the bark off the tree, which starves the tree from nutrients. And so it's literally choked to death uh, uh, over the next year or so. Now, the, uh, in, a, in, in an epidemic situation, on that tree there will be thousands or tens of thousands of the beetle larva. Uh, and, and so instead of being a small patch like you see on this tree, uh, we, we may have uh, a, a giant sheets of bark falling off at a time where the bugs have literally cut it off the tree. All right, then, then uh, those larva, while the bark is still intact, they pupate into an adult beetle. The next warm season, they fly to, the, to other green trees. All right. One of the reasons that we have these epidemics that, that become so, so terrible is, is because most of our western forests are too thick, the trees are too close together, and uh, the mature spruce trees or lodgepole pine, whichever forest you're in, are stressed, and that's the time when they're most susceptible to a bark beetle uh, invasion. The, the uh, you know, the fact that for many, many years we have pretty much suppressed naturally occurring low intensity fires in our national forest has helped set up the perfect storm. Politics, has done more than its share in setting up the perfect storm. When, when somebody with good intentions feels like that we need to set aside uh, good forest land as wilderness area or in other ways make it off limits, they generally do that thinking that it's gonna look the same way for their children and grandchildren and for successive genera generations. Well, uh, you know, just like climate change has always been a fact of life. Uh, changes in the forest are a fact of life also. And, and things happen. Uh, a forest, just like a garden, uh, thrives best when it's weeded and worked and uh, the weaker and smaller trees are removed, uh, giving more room for sunlight, water, nutrients, uh, and uh, space for trees to grow. And, and we have uh, done away with that good condition in too much of our western forest. And uh, as I mentioned, we set up a perfect storm which allowed the beetles to easily fly to the next green tree, the next green tree, the next green tree, and, and start killing those as, as they went. Uh, I want to show you a picture or two. This is back from the Yellowstone uh, fire in 1988, which conditions had gotten so bad before that fire that when forest fire finally occurred here, it was of catastrophic proportions. Uh, uh, it wiped out many, many thousands of acres uh, it, within Yellowstone and outside of it and uh, uh, endangered a lot of very historic structures. Uh, let's see, I don't have the old faithful in on, on my sheet, do I, Danny? I don't think so. We'll, we'll, we'll do that on, a, on another one. But uh, uh, look at the fire and how tall those flames are in the background. When, uh, uh, when that fuel burden burn uh, gets like that, it, that fire ignited in mid-June at the height of tourist season, 
And, and there's nothing humans can do to put anything like that out. Right. It burned until mid-November when the snows came. Right, right. All right, here's another uh, forest fire situation, which, you know, last year in uh, uh, southern Colorado, uh, we had smoky conditions for months because of several very intensive forest fires. And, of course, when, when uh, forest fires occur, uh, you know, a lot of bad things happen. That's affecting watersheds. It's affecting wildlife. It's affecting humans and uh, uh, economies. Uh, but, you know, just, just look at this, at all the deadfall that was a result of forest fire. And I, it was that, I, I think that was one of the shots you took from Yellowstone, was it not? Right, this is Yellowstone, and, and uh, because the way, um, you know, the federal government has such vast holdings out there, we deal pretty much with the uh, United States Forest Service, which is a unit of the uh, Department of Agriculture, and uh, where the uh, national parks um, are a, a unit of the uh, Department of the Interior, and they are never, um, they're never commercially logged like we do. Those lands, even in Cedar, inside the boundaries of Cedar Break itself, we never logged there. And the curious thing is, they would pay us as a contractor to come get it out, uh, where we, we bid and buy the timber from the Forest Service. Right. But in Yellowstone, um, when that fire, this is the aftermath of the 88 fire, and it's in, in showing some of that, uh, because that timber's not harvested, they allow those trees to fall and that fuel burden to accumulate. But the uh, Forest Service, or the, the, the government itself continues to evolve in, in, in learn and grow in how they manage fires over time. So um, we'll, we'll get into that some another time. All right, uh, we've been talking some about the Yellowstone Fire of 88. The Targhee National Forest in Idaho is just west of uh, Yellowstone. And uh, back in the late 70s, we bought lots and lots and lots of truckloads of cants or timbers from dead standing, primarily lodgepole pine to make our log homes out of. Uh, the beetle epidemics are certainly not anything new, but the intensity and size of the epidemics is, is something new. Uh, you know, you just, you can't imagine the number of trees. And I, I, I want to pick out this shot right here. In reading about the six million dead trees in Colorado, I'd hate to count how many trees or logs are in those log decks right there. Uh, and that was just from a small area. That, that many logs may have come off of 100 to 200 acres. Imagine if you have a million acres, uh, how many stems or logs that, uh, that you'd have either available for forest fire or available to use for log homes and other good products. Uh, I'm going to, I'd, I'd like to walk through just a little bit of, of what Satter White does in dealing with dead standing timber. We go in and, and do all kind of logging. Uh, we have very specialized equipment for working in the mountains. Uh, this picture we've used for years in our seminars. The guy on the right in the orange hard hat, that's old Bill Snow, and he's the, he's the buddy of mine that got me into the log home business in 1974. Uh, he was a young man from uh, living in Henderson, Texas. He's originally from Massachusetts, but he came by and asked me very simply if I'd build anything as different as an A-frame, which I'd built a, a brick A-frame, what I thought was going to be my bachelor pad. If I'd build anything as different as an A-frame, how about building him a log home? And I, I jumped it to chance, not having a clue what I was getting myself into. After many, many years, Bill has turned into a middle-aged or older man, and he came to me again and said, I'm tired of the timber industry in, Texas, in East Texas. Uh, and I said, well, I need a forester in Utah. He said, you got one. And so Bill was our forester, uh, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, 
for uh, 15, 16, 17 years, and we're still close friends. Okay, when, when we get to an area where we're going to be doing some logging, generally the Forest Service uh, uh, maps out, decides on a particular prescription for a mountainside, for a forest, for several hundred acres, maybe for just an area around a, uh, a uh, camping area that they want to remove dead trees. Sometimes they want to remove green trees, uh, maybe in advance of uh, a perceived uh, beetle epidemic. But, but anyway, there's an awful lot of planning that goes into it. Then, then we move in with our equipment. Uh, sometimes we even do helicopter logging, which uh, uh, a lot of you guys that are Vietnam vets uh, have spent way too much time on one of these, but one of our helicopter loggers even used Vietnam era uh, refurbished military surplus Hueys uh, to do their logging. Uh, the, the first one I showed you, this is a more purpose built uh, uh, helicopter. Uh, what's the name of that, Danny? K Max. That's a K Max. Thank you very much. I got a little story about this helicopter. If Go anybody's ahead. ever played an Ovation guitar, the guys who invented this helicopter, they're dealing with all those uh, resins, and and so uh, in their spare time, they invented the Ovation guitar with uh, that curved bowl back. Uh, same company. Why didn't you ever tell me that before? <laughs> we, we, <laughs> Negligent. Hey, Danny and I spend maybe too much time together. Okay, uh, moving from the forest, we've already seen that load of logs in the winter time, which we log whenever we can. Uh, boy, this is a monster. You only see uh, rigs like this in the Western United States and in Canada, but a, a truck pulling uh, double trailers uh, loaded with logs. This is our, is our yard in Utah, a company na named Barco, good friends of ours, uh, log for us or sell us uh, logs, and this is one of their rigs coming in. Jumping back in time, uh, you can tell by how old that, that Ford pickup is. This was a log deck at our mill in uh, Gunnison, excuse me, Gypsum, Colorado, uh, which is between Vail and Glenwood Springs many years ago. We operated there from 84 to 97 when we moved our western operations over to, uh, uh, over, to, over to Utah. All right, at our mill operations, uh, we, we take ugly dead trees and saw them into all sorts of lumber products. Uh, lumber as thin as one inch, uh, as large as 12 by 12, 16 by 16 timbers, depending on the size of the tree. But this is the source of our, our, our dead, dead trees. Here's a simple, old-fashioned type head rig that is the first saw that uh, uh, a log meets as it goes into the sawmill. Uh, the guy that's uh, sitting in that saw cab, his name is Terry Russell. He's been with me for, can't tell you how many years. He was, he was with me back in Colorado, and then when we moved to Utah, uh, he came with us. So, so that means that uh, he'd been with me something over 20 years, for sure. And his is a three-generational family working at, at Satterwhite. His dad uh, retired a couple of years ago. Uh, he'd been with me for many, many years. And then right now, two of Terry's sons are also working at, uh, at the same mill here. Why, why are we so hung up on, on using dead trees uh, uh, to make our products for log homes like these timbers that you see here? Well, the, the big reason is shown right here, and, and that is moisture content. By using dead standing timber, we can get naturally dried logs uh, who are, are dry all the way to the heart so that when we saw uh, a piece of lumber, a timber, a cant, anything out of that tree, 
we know that it's going to be dry all the way to the heart. We verify dryness uh, approximately one minute after the bark is first cut off of that tree. So there's no time uh, for drying to occur during the, the sawing process. But you know this reading you see right there, 13.4%, that is a very, very typical reading for dry dead timber. If that, uh, if that had been a, uh, a piece of lumber out of a, a green spruce tree, it would probably have been reading 40, 50, 60 percent or, or higher. Our standards at Cider White for making finished products going into your log home, that is, uh, especially house logs, our standard is that we will take no timbers higher than 16.9 percent. Now that's a, an arbitrary number I came up with many years ago from experience. Uh, uh, if we do that, we know that we've got wood that will shrink very, very, very little uh, negligibly once we build your log home. And uh, have, have you seen ever seen anyone else in the industry that would show that photograph right there? Danny, you're, I think you're pointing fingers. But, well, but, I'm, I'm but just, no, I, you know, I, I can't say that there aren't any, but I know that we are the only company I've ever heard of that tests every piece that goes into a, a, a in, into log home production. Every piece. Not only that, if you could watch the whole series here, going through the uh, 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 going through the mill, we even orient the logs so that the small end, that is the top end of a log, goes through the mill first, the butt end is, is last, so that when the, the lumber, timbers, whatever we're sawing, comes on through the mill, all of the wettest ends, which is the butt end of any piece, is all oriented to the same side, so that whenever we uh, uh, whenever we uh, do our testing, we know not only that are we testing every piece, but we're testing the wettest end of every piece. Uh, and, and it's funny, I, sometime I, we need to, we need to uh, demo that, of testing the wet end of a 16-foot timber or house log. And, and of course, the wet end is going to be dry, but the small end, the dry end, is going to even be drier. And typically, I'll see... Uh, one to two percentage points difference from from one end to the to the other. Now consider a consider a, a, a tree standing. Oh, uh, did I turn the slides off? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, consider a tree standing as you work your way up the tree, cutting that tree now a log that's been cut down into segments to go through a sawmill. Uh, let's assume we're cutting in 16 foot lengths, which is the most common length. The, the section closest to the ground, the butt of that log is gonna be wetter than the top end of that 16 foot segment. The next 16 foot segment above that in this, in this tree standing is gonna be uh, the, uh, it, it's gonna be about the same is the top end of the segment below, but the top of that segment is gonna be drier, uh, so and so all the way up the tree. Trees die from the top down, and they dry out from the top down. That's just a, uh, a rule of, of nature that uh, uh, always applies. And so, uh, uh, so we know that the butt of the butt log is gonna be the wettest part of uh, of that tree, and in every segment we're testing. Doesn't matter how small it gets, and we know it's dry, we still test it uh, because we tell our customers that we're gonna test every piece, and so that's what we do. Now, uh, uh, we end up making some beautiful house logs. Notice these house logs, and we this is just a picture that Danny took of a random unit of logs at, at one of the mills somewhere. 
Notice one characteristic these logs have. Uh, you may think it's negative, you may think it's positive, but almost every log has got a check uh, or a uh, crack somewhere in it. And, and uh, not just that, but uh, I'm gonna try some of Danny's technology and see if we can't zero in on, on a check. Uh, if we could look, let me look at, at another one that, that you can see a lot, a lot easier. Uh, that one. Notice that the check from the bottom right and from the middle left is heading toward the center. That little center dot that you see in the heart of that tree, that's called the pith, P-I-T-H, the pith of the tree. And checking from drying occurs from the outside in, so all drying checks are going to pretty much be pointed toward the middle of the tree. When, when we're sending that log through the mill, we can orient those checks so that they are less obnoxious and cause less problems. One thing I want you to notice in all the logs that you can see in this picture there are no logs of any size that are uphill facing on the outside of each log, which that, the, the rounded face of a D-shaped log, that's the outside, the flat side is the inside of your, your wall. And so because of having dead trees, our sawyer can look at the tree that he's sawing and he can turn it to best advantage for the quality of house log we're gonna produce. And we're always most concerned about the outside upper quadrant of a house log not being able to hold water or snow uh, and, and uh, causing any problem with rot uh, in the future. And that's a huge advantage we have in using dead, dead timber is that we can uh, 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 have a lot of control because we know pretty much how much checking that that log is going to have before it's ever manufactured. Now, going back in time, this is a neat, neat picture. And this, uh, do you know what mill that was at, Danny? I want to say dot zero, but it might have been that one down at... Um before, before, no, no, no. This is way before that. Yes. Before you, uh, South South Fork. Okay, it could be that may be at South Fork, Colorado, on Highway 160. There was a mill there that we did a lot of business with, and we uh, before we started planting our own house logs, we sent lots of loads of cans into them for for uh, for them to uh, uh, plane for us. I just want to demonstrate. Uh, a safety feature here uh, and a major change that occurred in logging. That old Kenworth truck had what used to be called trip bunks. And, and on the driver's side, uh, there would be a trip that he would hit with a sledgehammer and it would cause the bunks that hold the logs in place, it would cause the bunks on the right-hand side of the truck to fall away, allowing the load to be pushed off the truck uh, with a loader, with a forklift, with whatever, uh, or if, if everything was just right, the whole load being wrapped with a cable would roll off in a big unit onto the ground. It was a fast, very, very dangerous way of, uh, of, of unloading, uh, unloading log trucks. All right, uh, of course, you know, times change and the way we do things change and uh, everything I think is a lot better than, than back in those days. Here, here is uh, the way log trucks are unloaded now. We, we buck our logs in the woods generally to a 50 foot standard length and then we use a, uh, a uh, job specific loader. This is a log loader. Uh, made for that purpose to unload uh, one or two or three logs at a time off that and stack them to the side. Uh, this is back at our 
our uh, Gunnison, Utah plant. Okay. A few more things I'd like to show. It, Danny, have we, have we kind of covered the subject pretty well, do you think? Uh, pretty well. The, um, I, we, think, I think if 30 years ago, it seemed like in the industry, people talked a lot more about log spe species and uh, a lot of those things. And I don't hear that much uh, uh, discussion about various species anymore. But Sam does a, a great um, uh, wood technology presentation sometimes at our seminars. I don't know if that's on the schedule at these springs. We've had a lot of uh, changes. Uh, for those of you who have attended our seminars in the past, and well, we, we've uh, really revamped our presentations this year. Um, so, and this is also an unusual bit that we actually have seats available. We had a little uh, problem with our registration uh, system earlier, and uh, so we, uh, some of you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up the, um, the um, toll-free number one more time because you can probably still get a seat in one of our seminars right now. Um, and it's gonna be all new, actually where Sam is sitting here in, um, in our uh, studio, let me, this, a lot of you will recognize this area as, um, I thought I turned that off. This is our meeting room three that everybody will be in uh, this week after next. And a lot of people, it'll be familiar to a whole lot of people who have been through the seminars. Um, so uh, it has changed a lot this year. Uh, we're gonna uh, do some different things. And uh, we'll be in, in uh, LJ, Georgia this Saturday and the week following. Uh, we've never done two seminars back to back weeks. And it's because we had them scheduled different this way, but Sam's got a new grandbaby coming. And <laughs> <laughs> right. Our, our youngest daughter, Lindsay, is uh, going to domino sometime first to middle part of June, and we didn't want to have any potential conflicts. And my wife absolutely was not going to be in Ella J, Georgia, or anybody but right here when Lindsay uh, decides she's going to have that baby. Uh, so, you know, we're, as, as you know, we're a family operation and uh, I, never, uh, I never want to belittle that. Uh, uh, I wouldn't compromise on the way we operate. I'm, I, this is just the way I want it. I love it. Uh, I could preach on that for a day probably. But let me just, let me just wrap up by, by saying this. For, for all these years, we have been in the business of making uh, lemonade out of lemons. It's terrible the, uh, the size, the depth of these beetle epidemics that have ravaged the Intermountain West of the United States and in Western Canada. It's, it's terrible of all the resource that's been wasted because of this. I, I, I hope someday all the politics can be put aside and we do things that are honestly for the good of the forest and for the good of people. Uh, uh, maybe we'll get there. Back, uh, back when I mentioned that we worked real closely with the Forest Service and that we had public meetings in Colorado back in the 80s and, and, and early 90s, uh, and a lot of those meetings were about the attempt of the Colorado Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service to try to get a handle on these growing beetle epidemics. And, and so many folks were resistant to logging, not understanding the implications of not removing those dead trees. Um, it was a shame, but, but uh, uh, an awful lot of us have, have learned uh, from those mistakes uh, and, and most Americans appreciate the fact that we're trying to remove as much dead, otherwise wasted timber as we possibly can. Uh, I think the highest and best use of, of dead trees in the West at high elevation is, go, is for products going into log homes, uh, timber frame homes, uh, that sort of large pieces of wood. 
dead standing timber makes lower grade framing. So when you saw it two inches and thinner, uh, and it's already got checks in the wood, that, you know, in a lot of cases it ruins it for framing, but in all cases it's, it's lower end, lower grade wood that comes out of the dead trees. But it's, it, it is exactly what we want for our log homes because dryness is the most important consideration that Satter White log, ha log, log Homes has in, in building our log homes. We want to build log homes that are tight, that uh, don't leak air, don't leak water, uh, are unbelievably wind resistant. Uh, maybe you've heard on some of our other videos uh, me talking about the fact that as far as I know, we've never had a log home that's had the logs pulled apart or a log wall blown over in windstorm. And we've had them uh, subjected to all size classes of tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, we've had a lot of roof damage, we've had roofs removed, but, but in all cases the log walls and the, and the things within those log, home, log walls were safe uh, in, in uh, terrible tornadoes. All right, why do I talk about that and dry wood? Because they go hand in hand. If we didn't have the dry dead sanding timber to make our log homes out of, then we couldn't unitize our construction like we're able to do. We'd have to have slip joints. We couldn't have our roof tied to interior walls. Roofs would have to be uh, uh, tied only to exterior walls and a settling system involved. Uh, uh, whereas uh, the way we do it, we can nail everything together or screw everything together and make the strongest house you can ever imagine. Uh, visit with us and you know, if, if, you're, if you're traveling through the West, I'd love for you to stop at our mill at Chama, New Mexico our main mill in Gunnison, Utah. Uh, see the logs. Well, we'll even invite you to go up into the woods where we're logging, watch the logging operation firsthand so that you understand it from the tree standing that's been killed by beetles all the way to the mill, through the mill, through the planting mill, loading up on a truck and, uh, and heading to Longview, Texas. Uh, and then finally in, into yours or, or somebody's log homes. Uh, we could talk all day long about uh, spruce beetles, pine beetles, uh, but I'm not an entomologist. Um, I'm not a botanist. Uh, what, I, what knowledge I have is just from 45 years of experience and uh, by making and correcting a lot of mistakes. But I am unbelievably proud of what we do for the resource standing in the forest and for our customer that we're building a log home for. Thanks for being with us.